hey, when you get older, certain things are going to start happening to you. If that's what you focus on, then you're going to stop living your life. If you don't focus on those and you just go, okay, I've got them next, then you are going to be able to do other things. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Adulting can be hard, but you don't have to go it alone. I created this podcast to give you inspiration and let you know you're not alone in feeling stuck in midlife. Both men and women are welcome here, but if you are a woman, I also invite you to join our Midlife Uprising community for women, where we're making waves and reimagining what it means to age. Being part of this community for women will remind you on a regular basis that you're not too old and it's never too late to do that thing you've been thinking about. You can find more information at latebloomerliving.com forward slash community and I hope to see you there. Hello, my friend. Hey, if you're harboring dreams of writing a novel but worry that it may be too late for you, I'm here to provide you with yet more evidence that it's never too late. Last week I had Rebecca Keller join us as a first time published author with her suspenseful novel, You Should Have Known. If you missed that episode, go check it out. And today I'm so thrilled to introduce you to another new author, Rick Blyweiss, who published his first novel at the age of 77. Yeah, yeah, you heard me right. Rick is the perfect example of the saying, you're never too old to follow your dreams. In his first career, he was a music industry executive and record producer who worked with, gosh, many superstars, and, and he did film soundtracks and produced over 50 records, including one that was Grammy-nominated. He then retired from the music industry and, and relocated out to the West Coast, but it wasn't long before Rick was unretired and found himself working in the publishing industry. Since 2006, he's been head of business development for Blackstone Publishing and Audio. His first novel, Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives, I love that title, was Amazon's number one best-selling cozy mystery and number one historical mystery, and now his second book in the series, Murder in Haxford, has been published and is garnering some fabulous reviews. They're very fun. I, I just can't wait for you to hear this conversation. So we're going to dive right in. Without further ado, here's Rick Blyweiss. Let's go. Hey, Rick, thank you so much for being with me today. My pleasure. Glad to be here. I have to say, I am having so much fun reading your books. I just finished the first mystery and now I'm in the middle of Murder in Haxford and Pinyon Scorpion is just, he's, he is a character. He is. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the distinct characters that you've got going in this book and, you know, the regulars that hang around the barbershop. So a question for you, are they based on anybody that you know? No. No, okay. I, no, I, they, they aren't. Actually, uh, the, the way that I write is I'm a, I'm a pantser. Um, I, I just sit, um, I see the book play out in my head like a movie. And my job is like to sit at a computer keyboard and capture what I'm seeing for a potential reader. And um, no, none of these characters are actually based on anybody I know in any way, shape or form. So now you weren't always a fiction writer. I want to go back in time with you to sure. to your previous uh, careers, I will say, because because <laughs> you've done some pivoting in your lifetime. You were in the music industry. Well, first of all, you used to be a performer, right? You used to play. Yeah, I, yes, I I um, 
I started taking classical guitar lessons when I was very, very young. And then as soon as I saw and heard a cowboy named Gene Autry playing a guitar, uh -huh. I'm singing uh, back in the saddle again, uh, sitting on his horse champion, I got hooked on more than just classical. And then when I heard rock and roll, my life changed and I bought electric guitars and basses and I performed for a number of years in bands. Then I became a record producer. I produced over 50 albums and singles. I have a Grammy nomination. Uh, one of my records I produced was used by the National Football League as a music bed, another in a Coca-Cola commercial for five years. And um, yeah, so I, I did that. I, I kind of inherited left brain, right brain equilibrium from my parents. They were both creative and business oriented. And that's kind of been the story of my life, that I've always pursued what I call the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, um, you know, with, with opportunities and creative things, while at the same time being an executive in the music industry and now the publishing industry. You make it sound like a lot of fun, Rick, and it, it, it has it been a fun ride? That That is actually a word that I use often to describe my life and what I've done in my life. It's been a ton of fun. And even when I chased the pot of gold and I didn't find it, I mean, I've had some failures. It was the chase that was even more fun than whether I found the pot of gold or not. So, yeah, fun is, I. you know what, if you can't have happiness and fun in life and you don't have health, happiness and fun, you know, you're, you're missing something in life. Yeah. So this latest pivot that you've done, I just want to um, let everybody know. I mean, you had your first novel published at, at the age of what? 77. 77. That, yeah. give, that gives me such hope. I, I, I absolutely love that. And when you, when you, I'll put it in quotes, retired from right. the music industry, you didn't just retire, you you went on to a whole other career. Well, I yeah, I kind of get bored easily. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, when I retired from the music industry, which was in 2002, I, uh, my wife and I moved from New York City to the small little town of Ashland, the southernmost part of Oregon, uh, essentially to retire. And, and I started getting bored. And so I did nonprofit work. I joined the board of the of directors of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Independent Film Festival. I worked on the food banks, obtaining their permanent building. I was on the president's board of Southern Oregon University for 10 years. And then I kind of figured and realized those were great, but they weren't fully utilizing all the knowledge and skills that I had acquired while being a senior executive in the music industry and working on huge soundtracks and with superstar artists. And, you know, I had a wealth of business knowledge. So um, about, I guess, five years after we moved here, four or five, four years after we moved here, I got introduced to the founder and owner of Blackstone Publishing, which at the time was called Blackstone Audio, which happened to be located here in Ashland. Mm -hmm. And I um, got offered, along with my wife initially, and then she re fully retired, to be consultants and be on their first board of directors. And I did, and that was in 2007. And I've been with Blackstone ever since. I'm the head of business development. and loving what I do there. And it, 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 it was just a whole new industry that I went into at about age 63. That's incredible. So, man, I, I have to tell you, like, sometimes I get nervous, Rick, when I have somebody on who is like you, who, <laughs> <laughs> if you'll pardon me, but there's almost, um, a superhuman quality to <laughs> to what you've done sometimes and and this is because i've i've heard this from some of my uh podcast listeners and friends sometimes they'll they'll hear from a guest like you and think well wow they're amazing but they it's hard for them to see themselves in in that and so i want to ask you like have you ever 
come across a, a point in time in your life where you felt less than or stuck or or like something wasn't quite right and you couldn't wrap your head around it or you didn't know like did you ever come across any like stumbling points that that weren't easily overcome i i i might if i think about it there may be more than one but mm -hmm. one specifically comes to mind because i'm pretty resilient and you know i have a very very positive attitude i mean you know like one of the things one of my sayings is I don't dwell on my failures. I revel in my successes. So, you know, it's like I, I don't focus on failure or negativity. But there was one uh, significant position I had in the music industry in a company where, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, my boss asked me to do something that I thought was, in, uh, was not ethical. And I refused to do it. And as a result, for three years, I became persona non grata in his eyes. And I was, at that period, I had a family. I had a concern about having a roof over our heads. You mm -hmm. know, I had a young family. And uh, I just uh, was wallowing in still doing my job to the absolute best of my ability and doing well, but in a toxic environment that I was having finding it hard to extricate myself from. Mm -hmm. That's about the only time I can remember in my life where it just wasn't, you know, an upward movement or something just enjoyable and new. Yeah. And they, and definitely, I, I mean, I can hear that you would just attribute that to a positive, like, outlook. You sound incredibly resilient. That, you know, it, it, you have to take chances in life, you know, I mean, that, that makes life interesting yeah. and opens opportunities. Do you find yourself when you're, when you, when you take it, take on a challenge, do you have fear that you've got to like talk yourself through or do you just kind of have a general point of view that says, eh, let's try it. Let's start again. So I'll see what happens. Definitely the latter. I, I, I kind of go into most everything that I do is saying, this is going to be a home run. This is going to be very successful, but knowing that it may not be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, like I said, I produced Grammy nominated records that sold half a million and, you know, went high up on the charts. And at the same time, I started a company, a tourism company in New York. It was called Your Name and Lights on Broadway. And I put people's names on this enormous electronic sign right on the building where the apple drops on New Year's. And you could like order anything you want. You could say, I love you, happy anniversary, will you marry me? You could be there when it happened. I could get you a t-shirt or a photo of it. It was an abysmal failure. Really? And it cost me a lot of money. Would, I would think what a home run. That seems like. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it wasn't. Um, I, I don't know why. I don't know if it was the direct marketing, even though I hired a major direct marketing firm to work with me on it. Maybe. I don't know. But it, it was a failure and it cost me a lot of money. But my, my attitude when it failed was, all right, what's next? You can't dwell on your failures. You can't dwell on negativity. It's just, it, it, what good does that do? It's a great question. <laughs> you, know, just... there, 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 you know, there's a character. Do, do you ever watch the TV show Grace and Frankie? Yes. Okay, love I, I love that show. Love it, yes. There's a character on there named Mary Elizabeth. Uh, she's one of their friends. Yes. She, I think she even started maybe as their housekeeper or something like that. And uh, or somebody's he, assistant, right? Yeah, or some, right. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Well, now, obviously, what I'm about to tell you were words that she said, but that were written by the writers of the show. But in one of the last episodes, she made a statement that I found so wonderful and so exemplary. Uh, uh, so similar to my attitude that I had to like write it down. And, and what Mary Elizabeth said, you are always going to be disappointed if all you remember are your failures. And you know, mm. you need to remember your successes. 
every writer, everybody involved in, in creative gets negativity. I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, but The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which is one of the most successful books. Fantastic. Um, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. But a major reviewer, I think it was the New York Times, but I'm not 100% sure, basically in reviewing that book when it came out, said this is the worst book I've ever read. Really? Every, every creative endeavor gets negatives, whether you're rejected by a publisher and you love your manuscript and they don't, whether it comes out and and somebody trashes it in a review, it happens. Get over it. <laughs> There's no other way of dealing with it. it. Focus on the positives, not the negatives. Yep, man. I, I'm you're just a shot in the arm. I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna replay this this sound whenever I start to go down the wrong path, Rick. I'm gonna be like, Rick, what would Rick say? So <laughs> that's wonderful. Hey, we're gonna take a quick break here because I wanna let you know that this podcast episode is brought to you by Midlife Cues. Are you looking to live life more intentionally and grow personally as you get older? The Midlife Cues newsletter is the perfect solution for you. Every Sunday, you can open up your email to find a weekly newsletter filled with carefully researched resources and tools to help you live your best life. It's written and published by Lou Blazer, who left a successful career in corporate America and now focuses on helping midlifers be truly happy and feel fulfilled in the second half of their lives. You can subscribe today at Midlife Cues. Dot com. Let's go to your latest pivot and talk about how you ended up. Now, you, you always have done writing as part of like business work and, and different things like that, right? But how did you make the, the left turn into, into writing fiction? Well, okay. And I have written mostly nonfiction, whether it was business or uh, I wrote some newspaper columns and some magazine articles, but they're always nonfiction. Well, what happened was when I moved to Ashland, uh, my next door neighbor, who I got friendly with, a woman named Peggy, was a poet, a published poet. And yeah, she and I got friendly, and she learned from me that I had written in my life, but all nonfiction. And one day she said, you know, I'm in a writer's group, and we have memoirists, we have fiction writers, we have short story writers, novelists, poets. I think you'd like the people in the group, they'd like you and maybe it'll start your juices going toward fiction. So I said, sure, why not? You know, it'd be fun. And so I joined the group and true enough, I loved the people in the group. They were wonderful writers and uh, they apparently liked me. And I stayed in the group for a number of years and I started writing short fictional sto short stories after short right after joining that group and um i wrote two other novels one science fiction and one magical realism that never have been published may never be published i don't know um but and, and then i wrote short stories i put together a short story book i never published that either but one of the short stories in there was a short story that came to me about pinion scorpion and his barbershop detectives and when I brought that to the group, they said, this is the one. You've got to turn this into a novel. This is going to be your home run. And so I did. And it took me a number of years to finish it because I was working on so many other things in between. But right. I finally did. And, yeah. and that's how I started writing fiction. Wow. What is your writing practice? What, what do you do to to sit down and get it done? How do, you, how do you manage that with your busy life? You know, it, it depends whether I have a writing schedule or not, a deadline. Mm. You know, for the first book, I didn't have a deadline because nobody was publishing it until and it, I got an agent and the agent brought it to publishers. So, you know, I had no routine. It was like I would sit down occasionally and I'd write and then something would come to me and I'd go, oh, I got to capture that and I'd sit down and write it. And it took me a number of years to write that book, no deadline. The second book, uh, I had one year to write because I had a publishing contract and I had a commitment. So what I really did was, I, as opposed to daily commitments to myself, 
what I did was I set up monthly goals. I knew I wanted it to be approximately 80 to 85,000 words, divide that into, I needed to deliver it in about 10 months. So that was, you know, X number of words per month, uh, 8,000 words a month. So I would just monitor myself and there were days I didn't write at all. And there were days I sat down and write for 12 to 14 hours. And it worked out, I hit my deadlines, I'm good at deadlines. And uh, I just find when I have a deadline, it forces me to write more often. Yeah, deadline, boy, there's nothing like a deadline, <laughs> right? I know, <laughs> absolutely. Love them, hate them. I'm just raising yeah. my hand right now to say love them, hate them. But, you know, um, having to produce the podcast every week, there are days when I am sliding in under the wire, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah, I, I totally get it. And, and you know, I, I got it. I, well, no, go ahead. I, I was going to say something else. That, no, no, go ahead. Yeah. But, you know, what I was going to say is, you know, that, that when um, when, I, when I first got, I, I got multiple offers on, on, the, on the first book from pub, multiple publishers. And I ended up going with Blackstone because I wanted to be with them and they wanted the book. And so, you know, it, it was a great fit. But what I kind of did then was realized I could be kind of an example and maybe hopefully an inspiration to other seniors to try things later in life because I just know seniors in my own personal life who kind of go I'm old I can't do anything you know what's the sense of trying something new and I kind of want to talk people out of that if you will yeah so so um I did I, I and, and I've done I've done lectures to Ali groups at universities across the U.S. on this subject and things like that on the topic. And um, and so what I did was I really started researching um, other people that did things later in life that I, you know, that I could use as motivation for me and as examples for others. And, you know, one of the first things I found was, was a quote from Betty, Betty Friedan, you know, who, who basically said, aging is not lost youth but a new stage of opportunity and strength. It's one and of my that, favorite quotes. Yeah, yeah, that resounded with me. And then I found things like, there's a writer named Harry Bernstein. He wrote a book called The Invisible Wall, which was a, a hit book. He wrote it at age six, 96, okay? Love it. Grandma Moses started painting at age 77. Frank and then McCoy. was prolific, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, crazy. And, and like Laura Ingalls wrote Little House on the Prairie and Frank McCourt wrote Angela's Ashes in their 60s. And then another cool one was Clara Peller. You probably don't know her name. No. But there was an, a Wendy's commercial where a woman goes, where's the beef? That was her? That was her. And she got her first acting gig at 81. So, you know, I'm, I'm like going, gosh, if these people can do it, why can't I? Exactly. We are, I mean, I, I, I talk about this a lot. Ageism is real. It's yep. there. We've all absorbed it. And because we've all absorbed it, I think the, 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 the most difficult form of ageism to overcome is what we are telling ourselves. It's what we, what we do against ourselves and how we keep ourselves from taking chances because we tell ourselves we're too old or it's too late. You're right. But but I've got to tell you, and, and I, I just want to interject this. One of the things that also concerns me, and this is, is reverse ageism in a way, is that I'm very, very active on social media. And, um, and I have encountered many younger people who have a defeatist attitude, that their attitude is, I'm going to get rejected, so why try? And so it really isn't just an issue for seniors. It can, it's oh. an issue across the whole age spectrum, but maybe worse for seniors because they have fewer years to correct that attitude. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, speaking from my own experience, the so ageism goes both ways. And, you know, I think, I think millennials and Gen Z have have taken a really bad rap first of all right. um i think there's some you know it's hard first of all it's hard to classify a generation in anyway it's all kind of false but 
you know, if you if you look at what as a group, as an amalgus group, the the millennials are doing, they're they're kind of transforming the workplace yeah. and and that in saying it's that we need balance, you know. I agree. I think that I, there's something I, wonderful about that. And I think Gen Z is taking that next level. You know, I see a lot of hope there. But as a young person myself, I was ageist against myself as a young person. I, you know, I I was in the theater and I was an actress. And when I thought about possibly directing, I told myself I was too young. I didn't have uh, enough experience. The next thing I knew, I was telling myself I was too old. <laughs> I get it. It was Time like, well, when quickly. is when was the right time, Yvonne? <laughs> no, you're so absolutely it, right. You, you have to go for things when they're presented to you or you, it's the, you know, you come up with them. I mean, you know, if you delay things, many of them will never get done. Exactly. Oh my gosh. And I, I've tried a lot of things in, in, you know, in my later years, since in my sixties and seventies, I, uh, I, I did, because uh, I'll try things. As long as they're legal and are not going to harm me or anyone else, why not? But I mean, I, it, I've, uh, I've done hypnosis and past life regression. I've done significant manifesting and meditating. Um, you know, I, I created a video game that's now up on Google and, and Apple in their app stores. Very I mean, cool. You know, I, you know, I've just kind of said, hey, life, yes, go back to the word fun. Life can be fun. What would be fun? Well, I think that is the, that is the key, Rick, is is paying attention to what you think is fun. And then like just like go down that path. You're you're a dabbler, you know, <laughs> I, you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. Let's check that out. And I think right. if we all could open ourselves up to that sense of like, oh, why not? check it out let's try it let's see how that rolls you know yeah, yeah I did a tv interview for the first book and um it, it, it was centered uh, not just around the release of the first Scorpion book but also focused on me being 77 and having my first published novel and you know one of the quotes that I said on that show was if I had just said I'm too old nothing can happen to me nothing would have happened to me you know, and th so you need to and have then the you prove yourself right, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You need to say, "I'm not too old." Something can happen to me. I love that. Oh my goodness! What What are you excited about that's coming up next? I mean, the book's coming out soon, right? Yeah, it's coming out on February 21st. So by the time this airs. It probably is already going to be it in the marketplace. It will already be in the, yeah, yeah. Because so, we're, yeah, you, yeah it'll be, this will be out in April. So right. your book's out. And then do right. you have like anything else you're dabbling with? It is like, hmm, let's see where that goes. Actually, I, yes, I, I am. I'll, I'll talk about what I'm doing in the writing space. Um, I'm working on a number of projects. I'm working on my memoir. I am uh, working on, and my agent is now about to submit to publishers a proposal for a business book that I've written on how to be a good leader to maximize people and profits. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's just, we, we have very successful entrepreneurs in our society but that doesn't necessarily make them great leaders that people want to work for. So I think it would be good to write a book that says, here's how to be a good leader that people want to work for. And at the same time, maximize the profitability of your venture. So mm. I, I, I've got that going on. Um, I'm writing the third Scorpion book. I've mm -hmm. uh, already got probably a third of that written. And I'm also, uh, writing, I just started writing a book, another book, that is the story of a crusty old 80 some odd year old ex-military vet who's living with his uh, daughter and her husband and son and driving them crazy because he's really crusty. And so they move him into a retirement home that he doesn't want to be in. 
and he's really, re re you know, rejects going. <clears throat> but once he's there, he finds out that a group of the young teens are kind of harassing the residents of this retirement home. So he teaches the residents how to defend themselves and set booby traps. And it's sort of like Home Alone meets the best exotic Marigold Hotel. Oh my gosh, that is so fun. I My first thought was Home Alone when you started right. saying booby traps. <laughs> right, so it's sort of like, you know, sort of a combination of Karate Kid, Home Alone, and Best Marigold. So yeah, and I'm, I'm enjoying writing it very much. So I'm doing that. And then of course, at the same time, I have this full-time job at Blackstone and I'm signing authors and doing all sorts of other things in the scope of my job. And, you know, I, I just find it thrilling, everything, you know, it's and if fantastic. none of these books I'm writing now come to fruition as published manuscripts, so what? I really enjoy writing them. I love the process of writing. I love meeting the characters in my head and having them as an alternate set of unfictitious friends. You give me hope, Rick. I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> Gee, thanks. I appreciate that, Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> I totally do. <laughs> I don't know. You seem pretty good yourself, let me tell you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm on a path to, to, to hopefully like take on the type of attitude that you have, you know, which is just, why not? Why yeah. not try it? You know? Um, but I wasn't always there, you know, which is why I do this podcast because I, I feel like, um, I had a, I, a, a, switch flipped for me, you know, when I started taking care of myself, you mentioned meditation. And um, when I started meditating and doing yoga and getting up before my kids every morning and really just taking care of me, getting a little selfish with that, right. um, I started to feel better. I started to have energy. And once I started feeling new energy, I started getting hopeful about my next 20 to 30 years. You know, I was approaching 50 at the time. And then I started getting curious, like, well, wow, what might I do when I'm 70, 80? I don't see myself retiring. I, you know, right, right now I make my living doing photography, but I don't see myself as a service photographer when I'm 80 or even <laughs> in my 70s, you know. So what am I going to do? And as long as I'm doing something I love, I just want to keep working until, you know, until I kick the bucket. I right. want you know, um, and it, it all started with like taking care of myself and, yes. uh, and, and getting hopeful and curious. Well, I'd like to uh, address that. And this is something I have never uh, said on a podcast before. I, I don't even know if I've ever said this in print, but it, uh, and it, it relates to energy because there's no question. There are people whose energy is drained at a certain point in their life and they don't have the capacity to continue to try new things. I, I realize that I guess I'm blessed that I do have energy in my late seventies that is not that different from energy I had earlier in most of my life. But I, um, I've had open heart surgery that failed. I had stents put in because the open heart failed that they were concerned they'd pierce the artery wall and, and didn't know if I would live or not. And obviously I'm here, so I did live. I've had my gallbladder removed. I have neuropathy. I have tinnitus. And I don't let any of that get in my way. It's like, hey, when you get older, certain things are going to start happening to you. If that's what you focus on, then you're going to stop living your life. If you don't focus on those and you just go, okay, I've got them next, then you are going to be able to do other things. And like you, uh, what I did, especially after I had the heart thing, and I didn't have a heart attack. I just, they did the surgery because they saw I had blocked arteries. Mm -hmm. um, I changed my life, both with, not only with the meditation and the manifesting, but I now and my wife uh, it only eat organic. We don't eat fried foods. We, you know, we're dairy free, gluten free, grain free. 
we exercise, we do Pilates, we, you know, it, it, to me, especially as you get older, although I think it's important in your whole life, it is very important to take care of yourself physically so that you can mentally do the things you want to do. Absolutely. A, a big part of what I, what changed for me was thinking that I needed a, a, a habit change. Um, right. Because one of my habits was pressing the snooze button every morning over and over. <laughs> my kids were a little younger back then. And then what that did was create a cascade of of difficulties um, for the morning. And that led me into the rest of the day. It's I was scrambling from the get-go, you know? And so yeah. the first habit change that needed to happen was I needed to stop hitting that snooze button <laughs> which and I needed to get up before my kids so I could have that time to myself. That then meant that I needed to go to bed earlier and stop editing photos late at night after the kids <laughs> went to bed. Um, so you know, one thing led to another, but literally it was one decision and one commitment for 30 mm -hmm. days to say, let's see what happens, you know. Yep. And then on top, I mean, habit change is such such a an interesting thing. Besides the habits of, you know, changing my bedtime and my getting up time and those things, it's also a habit change of, of thought habits. You know, yes. what was I telling myself all the time? And those are habits too. Oh, yes. You know. The habit that I changed was, and I won't mention the, uh, the fast food chain because I don't want to get sued if they say, oh, no, no, our, our foods don't do that. Uh, but my habit was I used to eat, um, I would say two to four double cheeseburgers a week from a, uh, a fast food chain. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm convinced, I have no scientific proof, but I'm convinced that that's part of what led to the blockage of my arteries. And so that was a not an easy habit to break either, but I just had I bet to go it wasn't. Yeah. cold turkey. And, you know, I, I also, I, I smoked cigarettes for about four years back in the, in, in the 70s and 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And that was another habit I had to break because I knew I would be killing myself if I didn't. And so I, I underwent hypnosis and I walked in doing literally three packs of cigarettes a day. And I walked out 45 minutes after doing a, uh, a, a hypnosis session and never smoked again and never wanted to smoke again. Wow. So I, I get not, you know, having to break habits. You do. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and you can. Yes. You do. You just have you... to want to. You yeah. have to want oh, man, to. that is it, right? Want to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and you had a, a really good reason. Like you had blocked arteries. Sometimes we push ourselves into a corner and then our body is like, okay, no, I'm, you know, and, and then we, then we're like, oh, then we get this, we finally get the message, right? I know. It's like, it's, but sometimes you can get out ahead of it too. Yeah, you can. Although I also know some people that have gotten the message and didn't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. I literally am. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to keep some, some of this audio like on my phone somewhere so I can play <laughs> you. <laughs> occasionally. What I'm honored. Do. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Tell me, so I know you mentioned that you were doing some um some talking about aging and, and such with Ollie. Tell tell us more about Ollie, because I don't I don't I'm not familiar with it. And I have it from the notes oh. from the first time you and I spoke. Sure. Uh, Ollie stands for Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And uh what it is is it is an organization, I believe it's a, a centrally located somewhere in the Midwest, Wisconsin or Michigan, I, I don't remember exactly, but uh, virtually every major university in, and college in America has an OLLI division. And what the OLLI group does is they offer classes on a myriad, a host of subjects to seniors in the community. That's why they call it Lifelong Learning Institute, because it's like 
okay, you maybe not want to go back and sit in a class and do grades, but let's offer you this great plethora of topics and lectures and presentations. And uh, many, you know, most are done in person. Many, I, most of the ones I've done have been done virtually, but they do virtual ones as well. And um, I've done Ali presentations on the publishing industry, uh, on my life journey, and, and more than not than others on you know aging gracefully and and uh, fabulously. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. And, and so that that's what Ali is, and it's it's a it really a fabulous program for seniors. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to put a link in the show notes to that as well. So thank you for that information. Well, okay. do you have anything that you want to say in wrapping up? Because man, oh man, I I love everything that we've talked about, Rick. Um, well, I I guess the, since I I'm on and I've got a book that just came out when this show airs. I would just like to say that I am, uh, you know, the first book, The Pinion and Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives, was well, well, well received. It, it was a Barnes Noble pick, a Publishers Weekly pick, an Amazon editor's pick. It did well in independent bookstores. It went to number one in five categories on Amazon. And the new book, Murder Incredible. in Haxford, mm -hmm. um, already has a great Publishers Weekly review, a historical novel fiction review. Um, Barnes, it, it just literally a few days ago was named a Barnes and Noble top indie pick for February and March. Um, and so I'm just pleased, very, very pleased that people are buying it and enjoying it. And here's the main reason I'm, I'm pleased. And, 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 and that's not has anything to do with money. Okay. What it has to do with is these books are set in 1910 in a, you know, a countryside, fictitious English town. There's no gore. There's no blood. There's no heavy duty sex. It's like the Downton Abbey era. And mm -hmm. what people are telling me when they read the books is it's transporting them to a kinder, gentler time. And it's transporting them away from the stresses of today's society for a while. And mm. that is the intention I wrote them with in a way that I want people, again, to have fun and enjoy the characters in the books and 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 have their lives have a little more fun and a little more a little less stress. I love it. Yes. And I would I can see all of that and 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 congratulations, mission accomplished. Well, thank you. Yes. And I'm sorry I put a plug in, but you know, I'm a writer. What can Heck I no, say? <laughs> no. Thank you for, for sharing your journey with us. I mean, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. I love having on uh, authors that have been published later in life. It, it, I, I think it's just one of the most inspiring things I can think of. And it's, uh, and I don't even want to be a writer. I just think there's so many people that do, you know, that, I know. that stop themselves. And I just want to keep putting examples in front of people to say, see, see, it can be done. <laughs> You know, I totally agree with that. In fact, you know, I, I'm sometimes asked what advice I have for other writers who want to start out later in life. And, you know, one point that I make to them is, and it's exactly what you said, use your age as a focus for publicity, because there are millions of writers out there. What will make you interesting and set you apart? It's not just going to be your book. Mm -hmm. And you do have, if you're older, the ability to get people interested and become an inspiration and example yourself to other seniors. Here, here. I love that. Rick, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it. You know, there are a couple of things that Rick said in our conversation that, that I'm just going to print out, frame, and hang on my wall as reminders. When I asked him if he ever has self-doubts, he said, I don't dwell on my failures. I revel in my successes. And then he followed that up by saying, you have to take chances in life. That makes life interesting and opens opportunities. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What else is there to say? 
<laughs> if you want more information about Rick or want to get a copy of his book, I will have all the links for you in the show notes. You can just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and click on the show notes for episode 144. And hey, while you're there, you can score a free download of three meditations that I created as a gift for you. When you go to my website, latebloomerliving.com, there's a big yellow button at the top that says free meditations. Go get them. They're good for you. (laughs) Anyway, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.